Well, it's certainly good to see everyone this evening. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Ha, ha, ha. Well, we're not going to take a lot of time this evening, but uh, we do want to take just a moment, thank all of our friends for being here. Uh, Pastor Rafael and Maria Hernandez from Aposento Alto in Olathe, Kansas. Amen. And uh, uh, our new friends, Bishop Adam Blackstock. Amen. And Sister Blackstock, is that right? Pastor, amen. Praise God. Good to have them. Uh, glory to God from Glory Bible Fellowship International Church. And uh, all the way from Raytown, Missouri, Pastor Angela and Mark Gazaway from Faith Builders Raytown. Hallelujah. So God's good. Amen. We're going to prepare to receive uh, the Lord's tithe and your offering this evening. Uh, if you would like to give, there is an envelope there in the seat back in front of you. Glory to God. You can sow into the kingdom of God this evening. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, there's... Uh, there's something the Lord's really been talking to me and my wife about, and that's living out of our heavenly account. And, uh, you know, when you give, when you sow, Jesus said in the book of Mark chapter 10, he said that it uh, is credited to your account a hundredfold return. And, you know, if words mean what they mean, and they do, everywhere I see that word hundredfold in the New Testament, it says a hundred times as much. Amen. And as believers, we got to live like we have that amount in our account. Amen. And that, that settles the issue because you're, you're living from a higher plane. You're living from a higher plane. And so we praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. When you have your envelope ready, if you just want to lift it up to the Lord. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for the sowing. We thank you for the seed that's being placed into the ground this evening. And Father, we thank you for the blessing that's going to come on these people in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Come on, gentlemen, if you want to come with the containers this evening. Praise the Lord. And when you're ready to sow your seed tonight, just come rejoicing in Jesus' name. Oh, glory be to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Good to see you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, I call you blessed in Jesus' name. Favored, healthy, well in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Lucian, how are you, sir? Praise the Lord. Amen. So, Father, we thank you for the seed that was sown tonight. Lord, according to your word in the book of Psalms, you consider this seed precious seed. Because you said in your word, he that goes forth weeping, bearing precious seed, will doubtless return again rejoicing, bearing his harvest with him. And Lord, we thank you that we're not only sowers, but we're good reapers. And we thank you for the harvest in advance, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Amen. Well, uh, just before I bring... Uh, uh, Dylan up to uh, talk about some of their product. Uh, we have a graphic for you. Amen. And uh, you got it? That paid in full. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And uh, now we got to now we got to dream a bigger dream. So pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But right now, Dylan, come on this evening. Amen. Worship, 
was awesome, by the way. Amen. That was awesome. Praise Man. God. So I'm going to go over a little bit more products. I'm going to go back over two more products. Uh, sowing in famine, we talked about that, how Isaac sowed into the land of Egypt in times of famine. He didn't go to the world. He went to his God, and he reaped a hundredfold return. So make sure you get that. Amen. It's only like 38 pages. It's going to take you like 30 minutes, and it's about it's only $3. So make sure you go get yeah. that. And uh, never stop dreaming big dreams. Get your dreams out of the closet. Dr. Dr. Savelle talked about that a little bit in this morning service. And uh, get your dreams out of the closet. He talked about the Falcon 50 and how your dreams will affect everybody around you. And the next product I have here, look how nice this Bible is. Amen. Look at that fine leather. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but uh, this Bible is the 50th anniversary uh, Dr. Savelle Bible. It's in a King James version. It, it's called the Favor Bible, and it has five or ten favor lessons in the beginning of the Bible, Dr. Savelle's most famous favor lessons. And it also has a scrapbook, and you can see some pictures of him when he was, like, my age. Amen. So <laughs> make sure you get that. <laughs> I'm not throwing shots. I might be in trouble tonight. But <laughs> <laughs> my next thing I got. Oh, glory. Yeah, no, I'm, I might be in trouble. <laughs> but um, the next thing I got is our shirt, uh, Still Blessed and Highly Favored. Amen. Now, we've been selling out of a lot of these. We only have about eight back there, so make sure you go get them. We only have, like, 20 left in inventory. And... Uh, there's, you could go on jerrysavelleministries.org. I know we only have smalls and mediums back there. We might have an extra large or two at the ministry, but uh, I kind of want to tell a story behind this. Our um, One of my bosses, Richard Muchai, every time you ask him how is he doing, he says, still blessed and highly favored. Amen. And when you wear the shirt, and we also have hats of these, when you wear the shirt or the hat or the even the face mask that we have online that you can get, it's a te testimony that you can tell how good our God is even during a pandemic. Amen. And also, if you don't know, my grandpa is kind of a cool grandpa. Amen. One time uh, we were in the <laughs> store, and uh, – he was uh he was he put on this nice leather jacket and I told I looked at him Papa and I said, You got the drip. And if you don't know what that means, that's what the youngins say nowadays. It's another word for swag. Okay? So he he's got the drip, so make sure you get your drip. All right. <laughs> you see what I'm trying the to next do? Next thing <laughs> man. Hey, hey, and he's young, by the way. He's young, he's not old. Okay. The next thing, um, so I'm a football fan. And this is like my second time promoing, uh, the second church I've promoted at. So I'm kind of new to this. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, um, but I started watching film. I'm a football fan. You know how you watch film when you watch football. By the way, I know we're in Chiefs country. I'm a Packers fan. Y'all would have not, would have won if Rodgers was playing. Just letting y'all know. <laughs> hey, Amen. We lost today, but it's okay. We'll get that W. Exactly, exactly. But our international director, Joe McCroskey, he usually promos, and he always says this is the best deal you can get. So I'm going to say it's the best deal you can get. It's the 50 for 50 special. It's a USB port of Dr. Savelle's 50th fame or 50 messages, uh, his most famous messages, like the fourth man, prayer of petition, and Satan can steal your joy. So it's 50 messages for $50. And uh, if you don't see anything that you've heard of Dr. Savelle's before, you can go on our website, jerrysavelle.org. And like I told you, I work in the production department. So if you buy something, I'm most likely the one to, you know, ship it up and send it to you. So go get me to work, okay? <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Amen. I got it right here. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we're your favorite church, right? Yes. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, real quickly before I introduce uh, Dr. Savelle, of course, which he really needs no introduction, but, uh, you know, uh, some years ago, probably, oh, I would say uh, 2008, maybe, uh, the Lord was dealing with us. What he was dealing with us was with the television ministry. And uh, we, were, we were believing God for a lot then. And uh, the Lord was asking us to do that. And Michelle was on her way to uh, Topeka. And she was just worshiping the Lord. And, and uh, you know, honestly, we were, we, were, we were under some pressure at the time. And uh, she was listening to a message 
by uh, Brother Jerry, and he made a statement. You made a statement in that message, and you said, if you stop now, you'll never realize what God wanted to bring into your life. And she said, Philip, it was something just switched in my spirit. And she still uses that phrase today. I've heard her talk to people and she'll say, if you stop now, you'll never know, you'll never realize what God wanted to bring into your life. Amen. And uh, tonight we're going to hear words that God wants spoken into the earth from heaven. That's going to set the stage for 2022. And we're going to move into it with a roar. Amen. Not a whimper, a roar. The world's believing what they're believing. They're depending on the hand of the flesh, and it's going to fail them every time. But you and I, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what it looks like, we are abundantly supplied, and we have victory. Amen. Would you stand on your feet and welcome the ministry gift of Dr. Jerry Savell to this pulpit again tonight. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I'm so glad to know I got the drip. Hallelujah. <laughs> Somebody said to me one time, said, uh, Brother Jerry, I love it when you and Jesse preach together. He is so cool. I said, I was cool before that boy was born. <laughs> I love serving the Lord. How about you? Amen. In fact, it's, it's, it's the most fun I've ever had in my life. Amen. If I'd have known God was going to be this much fun, I would have surrendered my life to him just shortly after I came out of my mother's womb. <laughs> huh? But he has been so good to me, and I don't know why I'm his favorite child. I just am. <laughs> but you can, you can rejoice because you do come a close second. Hallelujah. <laughs> No, he's no respecter of persons. He loves you just as much, but he's been so good to me. He just makes me feel that way. Amen. Let's lift our hands and just praise him for a moment. Father, we worship you. We give you praise tonight. We want you to know how honored we are to be your children and how honored we are to be able to say without any reservation, Jesus is Lord. He's Lord of our lives, Lord of everything we do, Lord, of everything we have, and we give you praise for it. Father, I thank you in advance for enabling me to deliver this word tonight accurately, with wisdom, and with your anointing. And I thank you in advance once again that it will lodge in the hearts of every person who hears it and receives it, and they'll look back on this night and believe that it was a turning point. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And give the Lord one more good shout of praise. Hallelujah. All right, you can be seated. Praise the Lord. Now, I never heard that last song you guys did. And you wrote it? Wow, I didn't know you had it in you. That's, that was an amazing song. Praise God. And you guys did it, did it superbly. And you, my friend, you was getting down. <laughs> like Jesse said, get down with your bad self. <laughs> Hallelujah. I kept telling my feet, why don't you dance? Why don't you dance? When I get to heaven, I am going to ask God a question. You said you were no respecter of persons. Why can't I dance? <laughs> Somebody said, you're the wrong color, brother. <laughs> Amen. Oh, the Lord is so good. Amen. I want to uh, say a few things before I ask you to open your Bibles. It's important. Uh, and I said this the last time I was here, but I, I have to repeat it because I'm under the direction of the Holy Spirit to do so because it, it helps lay the foundation. In 1991, in Fort Worth during Brother Copeland's Believers Convention, Southwest Believers Convention. Uh, I've done every convention he's ever done. And uh, uh, before he started inviting other speakers to come, it used to be just he and Gloria and myself. 
And then over a period of time, he began to add other speakers like Creflo and Bill Winston and Jesse Duplantis, Keith Moore. And, uh, but back in those earlier days, it was just the three of us that did it. And uh, so we, we had several services that we did uh, every day. And then eventually, uh, Brother Copeland would have me not only do day services, but every Thursday night, he wanted me to do the evening service. And so this particular night, 1991, August of 1991, he introduced me to, to the audience there and uh, turned the service over to me. And then he started to walk off the platform. And just before he got down the steps, he stopped. He said, Jerry, wait a minute. The word of the Lord's come to me. Before you start, I need to share this with you. And so he began to prophesy over me. And uh, one of the things he said was this. He said, God is moving you into a new direction of ministry beginning tonight. And he's going to make you a seer, a seer into the spirit realm. And he's going to show you things to come. And it's part of the prophetic ministry. And he said, and then he's going to hold you responsible for sharing what you see with the body of Christ everywhere he sends you. And he has said some other things, but that was the, the, the gist of it. And uh, then he walked off the platform and turned it over to me. Then shortly after that, I was preaching out in Southern California, all over the Los Angeles area. I was in a different church every night. And I had one night off, Saturday night, and I knew Kenneth Hagin was going to be in Riverside. So I had planned in advance to be in his meeting. And uh, I didn't call Brother Hagin and tell him I was coming. I didn't call anybody on his staff to let him know I was coming. Normally, if I did that, they'd have a seat saved for me. And, uh, but I just wanted to show up and be in his service. That was the only service I could be in. He was going to be there for several nights. And so I was in L.A. And I've spent a lot of time in Los Angeles, one of my largest partner bases of Southern California. And so I, I'm very familiar with the area. I know how long it takes to get from L.A. to Riverside, even in heavy traffic. And I don't like being late. So I left early enough, I thought, to get there well in advance of the service beginning. Well, as it turned out, the traffic was terrible that night. I think there had been an accident, and uh, it, it, it prevented me from getting to the service before it started. It even prevented me from getting to the service when it started. And in fact, I was an hour late getting there. But I was determined to be there, even if I got in on the last few words that Brother Hagin had to speak, because I always loved sitting under Brother Hagin's ministry. He was one of my mentors in those early days. And uh, so I, I kept proceeding to, to make it to Riverside. And when I got there, the service had been going already an hour. So I walked in the back door uh, and just looked for a place on the back row to sit. I didn't want to disturb anybody. And much to my surprise, the Rhema singers were still singing. And Brother Hagin was sitting on the platform looking down at his Bible. And apparently he looked up while I was trying to find a chair or a seat in the back. And he said, okay, you can stop now. He's here. Brother Jerry, come up. The Lord told me you'd be here. I have a word for you. And so I came up to the front and Brother Hagin said, uh, you've, been, you've been holding back. And it's time for you to move in to this new dimension of ministry. And he talked about the prophetic ministry. And he, then he said, now, I'm encouraging you to move in, move up, and then move out. And then after the service, I got to spend some time with him talking about that. And uh, it was basically the same thing Brother Copeland had said, just a little bit different wording, but basically the same message. And then not long after that, I'm preaching with Brother Copeland again in the uh, West Coast Believers Convention in Anaheim, California. And on Thursday afternoon, I get a call from Oral Roberts. And he said, Jerry, when are you preaching again? I said, tonight, sir. He said, well, tell Carolyn to save Evelyn and I a seat. We'll be there tonight. I want to hear you. I said, can you come a little early so I can say hello to you before you go out to your seat? He said, sure. So they came and came into the speaker's room and we visited for a little while. And then I had an usher take them out and sat by my wife. And I began preaching that night. Shortly after I went back to the speaker's room, Brother Roberts joined me and he said, 
I'm not going to tell you what I heard the Lord say to me tonight and what I saw. I'm going to write it to you in a letter. So as soon as you get home, expect a letter from me. And so uh, I got home about a week later. And sure enough, there was a letter on my desk, a handwritten letter from Oral Roberts, about four pages long. I won't tell you everything it said, but at the beginning of it, it said, as I heard you preach in Kenneth's Believers Convention Thursday night, I heard you preaching prophetically. And I encourage you, every time you go to the pulpit, preach prophetically. God's moved you into a new office of ministry. So that's three out of four of my mentors who saw and heard the same thing within just a few days of each other. And then finally, my fourth mentor, which was T.L. Osborne. I was in Tulsa, and uh, shortly after this letter came from Oral Roberts, I, was, I, I served on Brother Roberts' board for about 20 years. And uh, I was in Tulsa for a board meeting, and I, I happened to run into T.L. and Daisy Osborne at a, at a restaurant. And Brother Osborne, he was so funny. He always, he, he was the most encouraging man I've ever known in my life. And uh, you'd say, Brother Osborne, how you doing? And this was what he would say to me every time. Oh boy, oh wow, Daisy, it's the smart preacher. <laughs> I'd say, Brother Osborne, why do you call me the smart preacher? He said, oh boy, oh wow, there's nobody that can tell a story like Jerry Savelle. Oh, you're so brilliant. You're so anointed. Oh, boy. Oh, wow. <laughs> I mean, if you were down, which I don't get down, but if you were down and you were spent five minutes in T.L. Osborne's presence, you'd be up. <laughs> That's just the way he was, a great encourager. And he said, you know, Brother Jerry, uh, I've been praying for you, and God showed me you're moving into a new office of ministry. All four of my mentors saw the same thing within just a few days of each other. So that was 1991. Well, what else could I do? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not like I needed another job. I, I started out in this ministry as a street evangelist, 1969. Um, no, no church wanted to hear a word I had to say. So I didn't wait for an invitation. I hit the streets of my city, Shreveport, Louisiana. 1969. The hippie movement's on, the drug culture's being introduced uh, like we'd never known before, uh, a, lot of, a lot of young people in the streets, and so that became my pulpit, the streets of my city. And I had such success in the streets, getting people delivered, and set free, born again, and uh, uh, getting filled with the Holy Spirit, that finally uh, the police department asked me to come every week to the jail and preach in the jails. And I had such success in the jails that the sheriff's department asked me to start going to all the prisons in Louisiana. I had such success in the prisons. And, uh, but there's only one thing with street ministry uh, and jail ministry and prison ministry. The offerings are terrible. <laughs> Nobody had any money, you know. And I asked the Lord, I said, uh, when do we get paid? <laughs> and I, I didn't know at that time how to make God my source. I'm just learning. I was like three months old in the Lord, okay? And then one night, <clears throat> uh, Carol and I were at home, and we turned the television on. And back in those days, 1969, Oral Roberts had a primetime television broadcast. So any of you remember it? And it was primetime. And a lot of times he would have on famous celebrities to draw the world in, and then he would, he would preach on seed faith and healing and pray for the sick and so forth. And that particular night, as we were watching, at the end of the broadcast, he held up a little book. And he said, I've just written this book. And anybody that writes to me and asks for it, I'll send it to you free of charge. And he said, the title is The Miracle of Seed Faith. I turned to my wife and I said, Carolyn, get the address. Here's one we can afford. <laughs> and so we ordered that little book. And when it came, I devoured it. The Miracle of Seed Faith. I have one of the original copies, and now it's autographed by Oral Roberts. That came much later. But that book changed my life. I learned how to make God my source of supply, because that's one of the things he taught in there. And uh, then, uh, it, and it all was based on seed, sowing seed. And, and I learned from that that if 
what you have doesn't meet your need, then turn it into a seed. Let me repeat that. If what you currently have doesn't meet your need, then don't hold on to it. Sow it as a seed. Now, Charles Capps used to say, and of course, Charles knew farming. He was a, a farmer. And that's, uh, when, he was, when I first met Charles, he was still a full-time farmer. And I'd, I'd, I'd go and stay some time at his home, and I'd go out and ride the combine with him and just, just let him talk farming. And, uh, and I remember Charles saying one time, if you're down to your one last dollar, don't dare spend it. Don't eat your seed. You still here? If you're down to your last dollar, don't spend it, sow it. Don't eat your seed. Amen? So that's how I learned how to make God my source of supply, by sowing seed. And, uh, and, and it, it amazed me that I learned that as a little boy on the farm in Mississippi where I was born. But I forgot those principles. My grandfather taught me that when I was just a young boy. But I'd gotten away from God. I'd gotten away from uh, my, my upbringing and so forth. But Oral Roberts stirred all that up in me. And, uh, and I learned how to make God my source. Well, over the years, God has, has never, 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 and I want to repeat, never let me down. Amen. Not Amen. one time. Never failed me. He's always met my need and above that because he's the God who's more than enough yes, as we talked about this morning. Yes, Anybody here this morning? Yes, sir. Look at your neighbor and say, you should have been here. That was a great sermon. <laughs> Amen. He's the God that's more than enough. He's the all-sufficient God. Amen. And uh, you could never outgive God. I've tried, but I can't. He always, he always... Uh, goes to the next level. Amen. So I was praying. Uh, it, it, I started doing this in 1991, shortly after these men uh, prophesied over me about the office of the seer. So that October, that same year, 1991, I decided that I was going to set time aside specifically during the month of October to seek the Lord as to what was on his agenda for the coming new year. Now, a lot of people think that's strange. You mean God would tell you what he's going to do in the coming new year? Well, according to Jesus, that's part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's right. That's right. That's right. Jesus said when the Spirit of God has come, or the Spirit of truth, he will not only lead and guide you into truth, but he will show you things to come. Amen. So that shouldn't sound unusual to people that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, I know a lot of people that are filled with the Holy Spirit that never make a demand on that. What do I mean by that? They, they never ask the Lord, what, what's, what's coming? What can we expect? You know, I, I don't like to be the first person to find out what God is doing. I don't like to be the last person to find that out. I, I remember when I first came to the Lord, and, and I was so spiritually illiterate I didn't even know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the same story. That came as a great revelation to me. And now my, my wife has been filled with the Holy Ghost since she's eight years old. And, and I, I went to her. I said, Carolyn, did you know that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wrote the same story? She said, is that all you learned today? <laughs> she said, get on back in there. God's going to teach you something. I, I thought it was a great revelation, you know. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't know anything. And, and I remember uh, as making a decision as I read the Gospels that I wanted to be like particularly Peter, James, and John. It seemed like they were insiders. They heard things from Jesus that the rest of the disciples heard later. I call them insiders. Yes. Amen. And I wanted to be like that. I, I said, Lord, Make me an insider. I, I, I don't want to be the last one to find out what you're up to. Now, to me, now I don't have nightmares, but if I did, my worst nightmare would be that I'm going that direction, and one day I wake up and realize God's been going that direction. That would be my worst nightmare. I don't have that kind of time to waste, and neither do you. Amen? The Bible says that we have the, the ability and the privilege to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. 
Amen. So one of the one of the aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to show you things to come. So once again, every October since 1991, I set the first couple of weeks aside just to seek the Lord as to what is on his agenda for the coming new year. And every year he gives me what I consider to be a prophetic word, and then that's my theme to preach all over the world. Once, once I receive it, the first place I take it is to our own church back home. Uh, I founded a church uh, 20-something years ago in, in Fort Worth. Uh, I'm the worst attending member because I'm gone all the time, but, <laughs> but uh, uh, I am the apostolic authority there. I have some wonderful pastors that oversee it. And when I receive that word from the Lord in October, then I spend the next three Sundays talking about it and laying the foundation for it for our church. And then we put up on our screens and keep it up there all year long what that theme is, what that prophetic word is. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So when people read it, they can run with it. That's, that's, my, that's my goal is to get people uh, thinking about what God wants to do and keep it in their hearts and run with it, praise God. Amen. And every year since 1991, what the Lord has said to me has come to pass in my life and in the lives of people who received it, held fast to it, and wouldn't let go of it. Praise God. Amen. So with that in mind, I was praying on October the 1st of this year. And uh, every time, and I, and I have this place I go to to, to do this. Uh, it's not the only place where I pray, but it's, it's, it's my special place place, you know, uh, I, I have a, as I said this morning, my, my background is in the automotive business, and I, and I left that business going to the ministry, but I've, I've, the Lord has allowed me to use what I used to do as a tool for ministry. He said, take what once was your passion and turn it into a tool for evangelism. So one of my passions was riding motorcycles. I've ridden, I've owned motorcycles since I was 14 years old. Started out with a Cushman. Anybody remember Cushman's? Motor scooter. And uh, then worked my way up to motorcycles. Well, I, I, I walked away from all that in 1969. My last bike in 1969 was a 1969 uh, Triumph Bonneville. And I, and I walked away from that. I walked away from the race cars that my dad and I built. And I walked away from all the classic automobiles that I had restored. And I didn't, I didn't be it. I wasn't involved in that again for 10 years. Never went to another race, never rode another motorcycle, never picked up another hot rod magazine. Cars was my past. Now I'm sold out to what I'm doing in the ministry. But then the Lord said, I want you to take what once was your passion and turn it into a tool for evangelism. So eventually I started and here's some of our members right here. I started the Chariots of Light Christian Biker Organization. Stand up, guys. Let them see the patch. Amen. These are some of our members right here. Praise God. Now, that organization, thank you, sir. That organization, since we began it, has won over 400,000 people to Christ. Amen. Amen. Just through the motorcycle ministry. Not anything else we do in the ministry. Just that one outreach. Over 400,000. We send teams of our Church of Light members into nearly every major secular rally in the country, not only here, but in Canada, Australia. I get to ride motorcycles all over the world. Yeah. Don't let the suit fool you. I am cool. <laughs> and there's just a stronger anointing in black leather. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and God's turned it into a powerful tool of ministry. Well, I've done the same thing with classic cars. In fact, let me give you one testimony, just, just one. I have, uh, I have a 1957 Chevrolet convertible that is absolutely immaculate. It looks like it just came out of the factory. And it was a basket case when I got it. I mean, it needed total restoration, frame off everything. Okay, body off the frame, start from scratch. So... I sent it out to Southern California to a friend of mine who's a professional restorer, 
And I, I said, I want you to restore this and get it to the place where we can put it in the next uh, um, 55, 6, and 7 Chevy, National Chevy uh, contest that they do out in California. And, I, and I, want, I want it to be up at the top. So he did. Every nut, every bolt has been replaced. This is a car that when you take it to the car shows, you jack it up on one side and put mirrors under it because it's just as beautiful underneath as it is on top. Okay? Everything is immaculate. Well, the first show we put it in, out of 1,000 points, I got 989 points. The only reason I didn't, didn't, did not get 1,000, I didn't have the original tag that came on it on the radiator in 1957. They docked me for that. <clears throat> I didn't have an original Delco battery. They docked me for that. And there was, uh, I didn't have the original uh, labels on the breather, and they docked me for that. But guess what? I got them all now. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I get invited to bring this car, as well as some of my other classic cars, particularly the Chevrolet dealerships in Fort Worth. They, they're familiar with it. They've seen it in shows, and they'll ask me to bring it to their car shows, okay? So going to a car show, you know, you spend all day detailing it before you get there. Now, uh, I have several grandsons, and I have two granddaughters. And the grandsons, not Dylan, he wasn't born yet, but the grandsons, the older grandsons, they would help me detail for about an hour, and then they'd get distracted, and they won't go do something else. But those two granddaughters, they'd stick with me all day. they shine and everything, they'd, and they'd go with me to the show. And you sat there all day waiting for them to judge. And they were with me from, from the time we got there all the way till the judging was over with. And I usually win uh, best of show with this 57 Chevrolet everywhere I take it. Okay? Now, this particular show, there was a man next to me who had a beautiful 56 Chevrolet, turquoise and cream. Beautiful car, beautiful restoration. On the other side of him was a beautiful 55 Chevrolet convertible. Beautiful car. And so, you know, we have our lawn chairs. We sit out in front of them, and, and people walk by and look at them. The judges come by and everything. And so uh, this guy that was in the, had the 56 Chevrolet, he came over, and he said, Sir, that is the most beautiful 57 Chevrolet I believe I've ever seen. I said, well, I was thinking the same thing about your 56. That's a gorgeous car. I've always loved those colors. And uh, I said, how long have you been in the classic cars? He said, this is my first. I said, your first? He said, yes. He said, my doctor said, I have six months to live. I'm dying of cancer. He said, I told my wife, if I've only got six months to live, I'm going to do something that I've always wanted to do before I die. I'm going to buy me a classic car, and I'm going to take it to every show I can take it because this is something I've always wanted to do. He called it my bucket list, okay? I said, well, sir, it is not a coincidence that you parked next to me. He said, really? I said, I've prayed for cancer victims all over the world, and I've got lots of testimonies of God healing them. May I pray for you? He said, of course. So I prayed with him, and I, I, I said, sir, I don't know if you know anything about this, but the Bible says, anoint them with oil. And the only oil I have right now is some motor oil. So I just took a little bit of motor oil. <laughs> and I put it on his forehead. I said, he didn't say what kind of oil, just oil, hallelujah. And uh, he got a grin about that, you know, and I prayed with him. And uh, I won best to show. He won best of class. And so we, we left and, and uh, went home. And then about six months later, uh, no, I'm talking, I take it back. About nine months later, another Chevrolet dealership asked me to bring that car to their show. So I'm there and I'm sitting around waiting for the judges. It's, it's an all day thing. And, uh, and I see this guy walk by and he says, hey, you remember me? I said, well, I don't remember your name, but I, your face is familiar. Where did we meet? He said, I'm the guy that had six months to live that you prayed for. Nine months has passed, and I have a clean bill of health. Amen. I don't have cancer anymore. Amen. 
So that 57 Chevrolet became a magnet for somebody that was in need of a healing from God. Amen. So that's the reason I still do it. It's just tools. Uh, and it's something I enjoy, but it's, it's a tool to reach people. You know, I, I grew up uh, around automobiles all my life and uh, 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 with the racing and, and the car shows and all that. And I know how those guys think because I was this way. That car was my God back in the day, B.C., before Christ. Okay? I spent every dime I had making it the absolute finest it could be. So I understand those guys. I know their language. I know their lingo. Amen. I got to drip. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and because I can, uh, I can identify with them, they also identify with me. In fact, one of the greatest, one of the greatest compliments I get, man, I never met a preacher like you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. I don't go in there condemning them to hell. I just show up. And when you show up with something that exceeds their God, and they want to know how'd you get it, and I tell them about my God, they want to know my God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I said that to say this. There, I have, I call it a shop. My wife says, quit calling it a shop. It's a museum. And it is. It's really a museum. And it is full of classic cars and classic motorcycles that I have collected over the years. Okay? And once again, I use them as tools. But on the second floor of this museum, I'm, I'm a product of the 50s. And I've always loved 50s diners. Anybody like 50s diners? So I had this dream years ago. I'm going to build this museum, and on the second floor, I'm going to build a 50s diner. Oh, it is amazing. It's just like a 50s diner. I mean, I, Brother Copeland came over to see it one time after I'd finished it, and I thought it was just going to be him and Gloria. They brought the whole family. <laughs> I mean, they filled up my diner, and, and Carolyn's making hamburgers and malts. And, and we're serving them all, praise God. And it, it's a place where uh, our grandchildren love to have their birthday parties and, and so forth. And it's just a fun place. And sometimes we bring our youth at our church out there so they can see the cars and the motorcycles. And then we take them up in the diner and, and have a, 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 just a fellowship night. But then on the third floor, now most people don't know I have a third floor. Don't tell anybody. And... Uh, <laughs> The third floor is my special floor. Um, I, my, my, my background is Cherokee. My grandmother's mother's mother was on the march of the Trail of Tears from, from Georgia all the way to Tahlequah, Oklahoma. And I'm very, uh, Keith Moore says I shouldn't use the word proud. <laughs> so uh, I'm very grateful for my Cherokee heritage. And over the years, I have collected a lot of Cherokee uh, memorabilia. And in that third floor, I have all this that I've collected. And also, I've, I've collected uh, pistols and rifles. And, and uh, um, it, it's full of that kind of thing. And that's where I go to pray. And I learned that from T.L. Osborne. Brother Osborne taught me many years ago. He said, surround yourself with things that bring peace because tranquility produces creativity. He told my wife, he said, Carolyn, if you like the sound of waterfalls, have them everywhere. Put them in your backyard. Put them in your gardens. Put them in, you know, dig a pond and put a waterfall in it, you know. And she loves the sound of water, and so we have waterfalls all around our house. And he said, surround yourself with things that bring you peace because tranquility produces creativity. In my museum, I have all these classic cars and motorcycles, but I have a desk right out in the middle of it. So I can just sit there and look at it and pray. And you know what? God enjoys my museum because he hangs out there a lot. He waits for me to get there. <laughs> but on that third floor is where I go every October to seek the Lord as to what's on his agenda. Well, October the 1st, 
I was there. And it, it doesn't always come on the first day I, I spend with the Lord. Sometimes it may be three or four days later. But this particular time, October the 1st, as I was praying, every time I'd close my eyes, I kept seeing this hand come out of heaven. And uh, I, I, I thought about it, but I didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Because sometimes you're, you, you're praying and you're endeavoring to be spiritual and something will come up in your mind, you know, and maybe have absolutely nothing to do with what you've been praying about. And, and you know, sometimes you just have to cast thoughts down and get back focused again. And, and every time I closed my eyes, I kept seeing this. And finally I realized it had something to do with what the Lord was trying to get across to me. And so I, I, I wrote that down in my, on my notes about this hand. In fact, uh, after I began to preach it at our church, this is what we have on, on our screens and what we give everybody so they can run with a vision. 2022, the open hand of God Unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision. Because the open hand of God always represents provision. I want you tonight to begin to expect the open hand of God throughout 2022. Okay? The open hand of God. Put your hand out like this. And that's what I saw, like coming out of heaven. That's the reason I had in my art department to do this. A hand coming out of heaven. And... I heard the Lord say, tell the people everywhere you go that 2022 to begin to expect the open hand of God and along with it, unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision. Amen. Now, that's what I heard the Lord say. But then as I began to study it, would you like that? <laughs> and uh, as I began to study it, I, I found some very interesting things. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar by any means. I can't pronounce but just a few Hebrew words, but I have a lot of books that are translated from Hebrew into English, and I study them all the time. So I went to some of these books to look at certain things related to the hand of God. The first thing I discovered was this, 2022, the number 20 in the Hebrew language represents Listen to this. The number 20 in the Hebrew language represents an open hand and giving freely. Isn't that interesting? That's what I saw in my prayer time. Remember the Lord said, you'll be a seer into the spirit realm. And that's what I saw, an open hand coming out of heaven. And as I began to study this, I found out that in the Hebrew language, the number 20 represents an open hand, or giving freely. And then the number 22 in the Hebrew language is quite interesting. It symbolizes disorder and chaos. Disorder and chaos is one of the things that the number 22 means in the Hebrew language, or it's symbolic of in the Hebrew language. Disorder and chaos. Now here's what I heard the Lord say. How many of you know we already have disorder and chaos? Not only in our nation, but around the world. Amen. I mean, who would have thought prior to March 2020 that our world would be like it is now? Now, I've had the privilege of preaching in 49 different nations over the last nearly 53 years. I have not got to go to the world since March 2020. Now, I haven't stopped preaching to the world because with our modern day technology, I can reach the whole world from my television studio in Crowley, Texas. I've got churches all over the, uh, Africa. I've got churches all over Australia, all over uh, the, the uh, UK. And I can preach to our churches from my TV studios live. Now, you know, I, I may, like if I'm preaching to our churches in Australia, I have to be in my studios on Saturday night because it's already Sunday morning in Australia with a difference in the time zone. Uh, some, of, some of those places where I have churches, they're 14 hours ahead of Fort Worth, you know, in the time zone. But uh, I, it hasn't stopped me from preaching to the world, but it has stopped me from going physically there temporarily. Amen. 
I believe it's going to open up, praise God. Amen. Because I love going. Uh, and I'm, I'm believing that this is going to change and I'm going to get to continue to travel to the world. Why else would God give me an international jet in 2020 and not be able to take it to the world? Amen. So uh, we're, 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 we got plans on the drawing board to go to, to continue to take the message to the world as we have in these previous years. But once again, the world we live in today is full of disorder and chaos. Now, here's what I heard the Lord say. He told me to tell you this. Are you ready? ready. You got your notebook out. You ought to write it down. He said, tell the people, in the midst of more and more chaos and disorder, I will open my hand and will freely give to those who refuse to be shaken by it. That's good news in times like this. Amen. I'll say it again. In the midst of more and more chaos and disorder, I will open my hand and will freely give to those who refuse to be shaken by it. And I'd like to add, that probably means less time watching CNN and more time with the Holy Spirit. Because you watch CNN long enough and you will be shaken by what you see. Amen. Nowhere does it say faith cometh by hearing in CNN. Faith cometh by hearing the word. Now there is something that comes when you spend all your time watching the media. Fear, dread, oppression, heaviness. Amen. But that's not going to help you. That will make things worse. So once again, in the midst of more and more chaos. So what I'm hearing God say is, this world we live in is going to get worse. Amen. That's prophesied by the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy. Yes, sir. Amen. Chapter 3. It says, in the last days, perilous times will come. Amen. The Amplified Bible describes perilous times as times of great stress and trouble, hard to deal with and hard to bear. Yes. Well, folks, we're already there. Yes. We're, we're not in the full thrust of the last day, but we certainly are in the beginning of them. Amen. And notice he said, perilous times will come. And you keep reading, and he talks about what will be going on. Well, if you read it, it's already going on. It, it may not be at the full level, but it's certainly happening right now. Perilous times are here. But if you keep reading, get down to about verse 13, 14, and Paul gives us a solution. Continue thou in the things which you have learned. Amen. Amen. In other words, Paul is saying, as the world gets worse, you don't need some new message that nobody's ever heard of to get you over. Go back to the basics and keep operating in the basics. They'll get you, they got you over back then, and they'll get you over now. Somebody give the Lord a shout if you believe it. Praise God. Amen. And it doesn't get more basic than what's your mouth. You know, in the churches I've been going to since August of last year when we were able to travel across America again, not every church, but so many of them, and I, I used to go to these churches before the pandemic, and now I'm hearing pastors talk differently than the way they talked before it came. I'm hearing uh, people uh, in the congregation that, that used to talk faith all the time. They're not talking it now. What's changed? Well, the circumstances. Yeah, but the word hasn't. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen? Amen. I'm still acting on principles today that I started learning in 1969. They still work. I said they still work. Hallelujah. And one of the first things I learned way back then was clean up my mouth. Change my vocabulary. Amen. Reprogram my spirit. Reprogram my mind. Amen. To the word of God. I found out back in 1969, I really didn't need a devil. I was my own worst enemy. And that was because I didn't know the power of words. But I certainly do now, praise God. 
Amen. And my life totally changed. I had, I had a, a lady say this to me. She heard me make these statements. She said, Brother Jerry, you mean we got to go back to watching what we say? I said, lady, why'd you ever quit? Yeah. <laughs> this is not something like high school. Amen. You know, how many of you remember the, when you first had to take algebra in high school? I hated it. I, I, I grew up an athlete. I played baseball all my young life. In fact, I played for a farm league team that was sponsored by the Kansas City Royals. That's as high as I got, okay? Had ambitions to play pro ball, but never made it there. But I played baseball all my young life. I went to college to play baseball, and they made me take algebra again. <laughs> Psychology has absolutely nothing to do with pitching a baseball. <laughs> and I remember... The first algebra course I took, I think it was ninth grade, first time. And the teacher said, Jerry, you need to learn this. I said, Mr. Nichols, I don't like it. He said, I don't care if you don't like it or not. You're going to need it for the rest of your life. Learn it. He walked away and I thought, liar, liar. I'm not going to need <laughs> algebra for the rest of my life. I'm going to learn it and I'm going to pass it and then I'm done with it. I'm going to throw this book as far as I can after I pass the, the last test. Well, I got married and started having babies. And one day, my oldest daughter said, Daddy, do you know anything about algebra? <laughs> I don't understand it, Daddy. I said, bring me the book. I had to read the whole book, and then we worked the problems. I could hardly wait for her to get home the next day to see if I passed. <laughs> and I did. I thought, okay, we're done with algebra. And then I started having grandchildren. <laughs> Papa, you know anything about algebra? I said, well, I, I don't understand it. I don't like it. Can you help me? Bring me the book. Read the book again. Could hardly wait for him to get home. Preston, Preston, my grandson, Preston. I said, Preston, uh, be sure and tell me how we did when you get home tomorrow. I passed again, praise God. Amen. I think Mr. Nichols might have been right. <laughs> I thought I was done with algebra. Now i got great-grandchildren. Uh -oh. And they're not old enough for algebra, but someday they will be. Yeah. And they'll say, great-granddad, do you know anything about algebra? <laughs> You're going to need algebra for the rest of your life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way you should feel about the basic principles Amen. that you learn about the life of faith. Amen. You're going to need them for the rest of your life. Right. This is not something you learn and then put it on the shelf. It works right now just like it worked the first time you ever heard it. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad you're here. You needed to hear this. Amen. 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 So once again, in the midst of more and more chaos and disorder, God will open his hand and freely give to those who refuse to be shaken by all the chaos and disorder. You say, well, Brother Jerry, how can you do that? Well, let me remind you, Matthew chapter 24. Jesus uh, is approached by his disciples, and they said to him, Show us uh, what's coming and the signs of the end of the world and so forth. And he started off by saying, Let no man deceive you. Amen. Let no man deceive you. That is very important. Amen. You ought to write that down because... Satan has absolutely nothing working for him except deception. That's right. Amen. And if he can't deceive you, he can't defeat you. Amen. 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 That's what he depends on, deception. Deceive you into thinking you can't make it. Deceive you into thinking that, that God doesn't understand what you're going through. Deceive you into thinking that that's just too big. God can't handle it. Any way that he can deceive you. So the first thing Jesus said to his disciples is this. And of course, we know that men are inspired by Satan just like men can be inspired by God. Okay? And Satan uses people to bring about information that is not correct, doesn't line up with the Word of God, to endeavor to deceive God's people. Amen. So the first thing that we need to understand is this. Satan will endeavor to deceive us when things get tough. 
when things are hard to deal with and hard to bear, but make the decision, I will not be deceived by my enemy. Amen? I will not be deceived by my enemy. Say that with me. I will not be deceived by my enemy. Okay? And then as you keep reading this, he talks about wars and rumors of wars and so forth and all the turmoil and all the disorder and the chaos that will be going on. But then he also said, this is only the beginning of sorrows. <laughs> the beginning. I mean, go read everything he said in Matthew 24 about what would be coming on the earth. And remember, he said, now, this is just the beginning. In other words, it's going to get worse. Amen. But then right in the middle of it, he says this. See that you be not troubled. Isn't that amazing? He gives us this list of all the turmoil, all the chaos that will be taking place. And he calls it the beginning of sorrows. In other words, this is not the end of it. It'll get worse as we go. But see that you be not troubled. Amen. Now I'm reading that one day, years ago, 40 years ago or more. And I heard the Lord say, it is possible to live in a troubled world and not be troubled. Amen. 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 It is possible to live in a troubled world and not be troubled. But the only way you can do that is stay close to God and stay full of His Word. Amen. Amen. Stay close to God and stay full of His Word. That way, no matter what's going on around you, you'll not be troubled by it. I, I remember back in those early days, uh, the Apostle Paul is just one of my greatest heroes. I, I've said many times when I get to heaven, I'm going to spend a lot of time with my Father God. I'm going to spend a lot of time with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the next person I want to spend a lot of time with is the Apostle Paul. And I plan to tell him, I've preached all your sermons. <laughs> He's just, he's just a man's man. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I love, he, he describes the things that he went through for the gospel's sake, which I'm convinced none of us will ever go through what that man went through. Amen. And yet, in all this list of what he went through, you can read about it in Corinthians. You can read about it in the book of Acts. And in Acts 20, verse 24, he makes this statement. Well, let me back up. He said to the people that he was talking to in Acts 20, 24, he said, the Holy Spirit has shown me in advance that every city I preach in, bonds and afflictions await me there. In other words, the Holy Spirit told Paul, everywhere I send you, prepare yourself. Trouble is waiting. Now, most preachers, after they heard that, they would have left the ministry. Well, if everywhere I go, trouble's awaiting me, I believe I'll go back to selling cars. Or I'll go back to, you know, carpenter work. I'll go back. No, but this man, he said, the Holy Spirit told me in advance, everywhere I go, trouble will be waiting for me. But then he made this statement, but none of these things move me. I read that, and I jumped up out of my chair. I ran into the living room where my wife was, and this is in the early days of my Christianity. I said, someday, you mark my word, I'm going to be able to say that, Amen. that none of these things move me. Amen. Well, you don't get there overnight, and you don't get there by just saying it. Amen. It's a matter of quality time with God, quality time in His Word, continually, consistently developing your faith, and fun, finally, there come a day when you too can say, with all hell breaking loose around you, none of these things move me. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I got there and you can get there. Amen. And you say amen. amen. You ask my wife, if she was here, she'd tell you, what goes on in this world does not rattle my husband. Amen. He is so confident that God is going to take care of him. And one of my favorite phrases is, and then my staff hear me say it all the time, none of these things move me. Amen. But Brother Jerry, we need a million dollars by next Friday. None of these things move Amen. me. God's done it before. He can do it again. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 
How many of you know if God provided manna from heaven, he hasn't forgotten the recipe? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He can do it again, praise God. I think you ought to lift your hands and give him a good shout of praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now, with that in mind, let's go to Psalm 145. Psalm 145, and let's begin reading in verse 8. <clears throat> the Lord is gracious. Well, that's, that's good news right there. And I'll drink to that. <clears throat> the Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all His works. Now, I encourage you to read this entire psalm, but for the sake of time, let's drop down to verse 14. The Lord upholdeth all that fall, and raiseth up all that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. Now remember what the Lord said to me, Amen. 2022, the year of the open hand of God. Amen. Read the next verse. Hallelujah. Thou openest thine hand, everybody do this, put your hand open like this. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. So notice when the Bible speaks of the hand of God, it represents provision. Provision. Amen. Hallelujah. Get ready to experience the hand of God throughout 2022. And it's not going to end by the end of that year. You just expect to experience the hand of God for the rest of your life. Praise God. Amen. Because as believers, as children of God, we're entitled to it. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, I don't know what you're going to do in 2022 but I'm going to get up every morning expecting the manifestation of the hand of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, let me, let me share this with you from another translation. It says, you alone, O Jehovah. I'm sorry. You alone provide, O Jehovah, and you do it liberally with an open hand. You alone, O Jehovah, Provide, and you do it liberally with an open hand. Notice God's open hand not only represents provision, but liberal provision. Not just enough. He's the God of more than enough. That's the reason I wanted to start it off this morning talking about the God we serve is the God of more than enough. He's a liberal God. Now, a lot of people, and I'm sad to say, a lot of Christians don't know that about God. You know, theologians have made it hard to receive from God. Religious tradition preachers have made it hard to receive from God. It's not hard to receive from Him. He is liberal. Amen? I mean, the Bible says God is love. And love is more than just words. Love is action. My wife loves hearing me tell her that I love her. But even more than hearing me tell her, show me. And I constantly show her. I keep Louis Vuitton in business. Because <laughs> my wife likes Louis Vuitton. And so do I. Hallelujah. Amen. I, 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 you know, as I said, I've traveled all over the world. And back in the early days, when I first started going to South Africa, during the apartheid days, uh, you, you'd preach, and, and, but you couldn't bring offerings out of the country. And so my offering would be a gift they, the pastor would take me uh, somewhere and, and buy me a gift. And, of course, South Africa is, is known for its exotic skins. It's known for diamonds, you know. And one time they took me to uh, a place where you could get these uncut diamonds and blessed me with one and brought it home and had it put in a set for my wife, made a ring out of it. That was my offering. One time I was given a a uh, uh, alligator briefcase, beautiful. And uh, uh, that was my offering. Preach for three or four weeks and come home with a briefcase. <laughs> but it was, it was special to me. Yeah, you know, it was special to me. And uh, 
uh, when I'd preach in Kenya, particularly out in the bush, the jungle, we, we call it jungle, it's the bush, they call it. And I'd preach in these villages in the bush. The, the people don't have any money out there, but they'd bring trinkets. They'd bring little beads they made, or they'd bring, they'd bring uh, uh, little baskets that they'd weaved. I wouldn't take a million dollars worth. I have them in my archives. They, they, they represent a, a very special time in my life. And they represent uh, the generosity of a people who had nothing, but they wanted to give something anyway. One time I was preaching out in the bush, and when I got through, they brought a goat up. And they had decorated this goat. He had bales around him. He had ribbons all over him. And they brought him up with a rope and said, they called me Doctari Savelli. <laughs> they said, Doctari Savelli, this your offering? A goat. Now you think, a goat? Well, my first thought is, how am I going to get this on the airplane? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think British Air is going to let me bring this goat home. So I said, is it my goat? Yes, it's your goat. It's my gift. It's your gift to me. Yes, it's yours. Well, I found out how precious that goat was because it represented the children's milk for that entire village. That was a significant seed. That was the best they had. So I received it. Then I turned it into a twice sown seed and I sold it back to them. Okay. But some of those same people today are not living in mud huts anymore. Amen. They're not walking Amen. anymore. They're driving, and they got their own homes, and Glory some of them have their own businesses. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You just can't outgive God. Amen. That's right. But Hallelujah. I remember one time I was in Zululand, <laughs> and uh, I'm preaching there, and after the meeting, the chief, and he was also the witch doctor of that village, he invited me to his hut. And so I went in the hut there, and it was so dark, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. And he's sitting there. He had me sit down in the opposite head. And, of course, he's, he's, I have to have a translator. And he's talking to me. And he said, first thing he said was, where did you get your power? I said, from the Holy Spirit. And then I asked him, where do you get your power? He said, spirits. Not Holy Spirit, but spirits. And then he said this. When you entered my hut, I realized your spirit is greater than my spirit. I want to know your spirit. Talking about the Holy Spirit. So I led him to the Lord right there. Led him to the Lord. In fact, to this today, we have a Bible school in his village. Amen. But I led him to the Lord that day, okay? Now, <laughs> he set up a special ceremony in my honor. And, of course, I'm having to have an interpreter to tell me what he's saying. And he said, we've brought all the women in the village together, and they're going to do a ceremonial dance in your honor. Now, I got my TV crew with me. We're, we're filming. I, I was doing an around-the-world tour, and we're filming all of it for a television broadcast. I didn't know that all these women <laughs> that were going to do the ceremonial dance didn't have anything uh, on from the <laughs> waist up. And we walk out there and I said, guys, turn the cameras off. <laughs> we don't do X-rated movies on our TV broadcast. And, and he says, you see. I'm a little embarrassed to tell you this. He said, you see one with, and he did the, with strong breast? I said, yes. <laughs> He said, that my daughter, I give her to you. Now, can you see me bringing this woman back home <laughs> and saying, Carolyn, look what the Lord gave me. <laughs> Jesse DePlant has heard me tell that story. He said, I'm going to start going to Africa with Jerry. <laughs> he said, all they gave me was a ballpoint pen. <laughs> look what Jerry got, <laughs> But, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but it, what he really wanted me to do was bring his daughter back to America, have her educated, and then send her back to him, okay? That's, that was the purpose of him doing that. But I have things in my, and, and she's not in my archives, but I do have things, <laughs> I do have things in my archives 
that have come from all over the world. And to most people, they wouldn't mean anything. First time I preached on the Navajo Reservation in Shanto, Arizona, they brought rocks that they'd gathered out of the riverbed and shined them up. That was all they had as an offering. I still have those rocks. I have those little arrowheads. You know, I have, I have little uh, blankets that some of the women made. That was their offering. But today, now I've been going back to that reservation year after year after year, and some of those same people today have homes, Amen. have trucks they drive. That God honored those little rocks right. because that was the best they had. God never forgets a seed sown. You ought to write that down. God never forgets a seed sown. And you might think it's insignificant, but if it was sown from the heart, it is significant to God. Can you say amen? So once again, you alone provide, O Jehovah, and you do it liberally with an open hand. One commentary I read made this statement. <clears throat> the living God has suitable supplies at hand, and these he gives until satisfaction is achieved. If I were you, I wouldn't, you know, uh, growing up, we used to have a phrase, you know, us boys would do arm wrestling and all that, or, or we'd get in wrestling matches and all and the only way you could tell when the other guy won was they had you to say uncle. That meant I give up. Say uncle, you know, and if you said uncle. Well, I want to use that phrase with this. The living God has suitable supplies at hand, and these he gives until satisfaction is achieved. I'd like to add, don't say uncle too quickly. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Until satisfaction is achieved. If satisfaction is not achieved, then just keep expecting the open hand of God because he's going to keep pouring out liberally until you say, I'm satisfied. Amen. Can you give the Lord a shout once again? We serve a good God. Amen. Another translation says, the Lord opens his hand and gives bountifully all things to enjoy. God gives bountifully all things to enjoy. Now, that runs contrary with most religious tradition. Yes, <clears throat> I never heard that when I was growing up. All I heard was God didn't want me to enjoy anything. God was a taker, not a giver. God was always out to get me. One of these days, he's going to get you. That's all I heard, a mean God. Well, that didn't attract me to him. But when I started reading the Bible, I found out I'd been lied to. He's a liberal God. He's a giving God. He's a generous God. Amen. As, as big and as, as, as we can think or dream or ask, He's capable and willing to do it even bigger and better than that. That's the nature of God. Now, still another translation says, And He satisfies everyone with favor, goodwill, and loving kindness. When God opens his hand toward you, get ready. As T.D. Jake says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Yes, sir. Get ready because God is about to pour out favor and loving kindness, benevolence to you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that good news in times like these? Yes. Amen. Satisfies us with favor. Now let's go back to Psalm 145. And the Passion Translation says this, When you open your hand, it is full of blessing. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. hallelujah. When you open your hand, it is full of blessing. Amen. I, I told the story, and Pastor was there when I shared it, back in our minister's conference he attended a few weeks ago. <coughs> Excuse me. I was preaching for Creflo Dollar a number of years ago. And uh, Creflo had built that big dome and he had two services on Sunday morning, several thousand people in both services. And I was preaching for him and I, I was maybe 15 minutes into the sermon. And I like walking around, you know, I don't like staying on the platform. He had a big, huge platform and 
I said, Crepola, is it all right if I come down on the main floor? He said, yeah, sure. So they brought the pulpit down there. And, and I'm walking in that huge dome. It's a beautiful facility. And I'm just walking back and forth and preaching. And, and there was a man sitting about where this gentleman is, about three or four rows back. And when I got over here in this aisle, this man got out like this. Had his arms out like this. Looked like he's going to jump on me. So I walk back over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I went to preaching and continuing my sermon. I forgot about that guy. And then I got back over here. And when, he, when I stood in the aisle like this, he got down like this again. Got right on the edge of his chair. I thought, well, surely one of the ushers is going to be watching him. Because <laughs> Creflo runs that church like a boot camp. I mean, you know, <laughs> you got great ushers. But this guy acts like he's going to jump on me. So once again, I moved over here and preached a little bit. And then I forgot about him. And I got back over here again. And all of a sudden, this time, he jumps out of that chair, runs up there, and takes a $100 bill and sticks it in this pocket right here. And then he runs back and sets down. Well, it caught me off guard. I'd never had anybody do that before. So I walked over to Creflo. I took the $100 bill. I, I said, Creflo, apparently he got here late. He didn't, he didn't get to give in his tithes, give in the tithes and the offering. <laughs> Creflo said, no, that's yours. I said, what? He said, no, that's yours. He wants you to have it. Well, I didn't want to argue with Creflo. I mean, I still got my sermon to preach. So I, I, I thought during the break between the two services, I'll just give it to him in the speaker's room. So I just put it in my pocket and kept preaching. All of a sudden, people started getting up out of the audience. I'm talking hundreds of people. You couldn't even see me anymore. They are surrounding me. They're stuffing money all over me. They stuffed it down my collar. They, they, they stuffed it in my belt. They stuffed it in my shoes. Pockets. Every pocket was full. Everywhere I walked, I left a trail of money. It's falling off of me. And Creflo's in the floor laughing. <laughs> he said, I said, Creflo, I don't know what's going on. I said, I, I didn't ask anybody to do this. He said, no, you didn't. He said, they just want to bless you, brother. He said, now, this is not your offering. I, I've got a, a nice offering. We're going to give you ministry. But this is for you and Carolyn. They just want to bless you. Well, I, I never had that happen before. And I, I was caught off guard. So once again, I thought, well, when we get back to the speaker's room, I'll just empty all my pockets and just give it to him and, let, and give it to the church. He wouldn't take it. And he had one of the ushers go get a trash bag, and they put it all in a trash bag, a black trash bag, plastic trash bag. Well, we got into the second service. I never said a word about it. They started doing it again. Creflo's in the floor laughing. And... and the, you can't even see me. I have a video. I, I wanted the video. I said, Creflo, let me have the video. I want to show this to my wife. She's not going to believe this. And, and I have the video. They totally surrounded me and stuffed every pocket I had with money. And I tried to give it back to Creflo, and he wouldn't take it. Okay? And so he said, Brother Jerry, you take this home. It's for you and Carolyn. He said, now, are you getting ready to leave after the service? I said, well, I was planning on flying back home. He said, well, Mama's cooked a meal for you. I said, no, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Creflo's mama can cook. She's a good southern cook. Now, I'm not leaving with Mama cooking. Boy, did we eat. And she finally walked up to Creflo, and she said, Creflo, I don't think Carolyn's feeding that little white boy. <laughs> I said, pass the chicken, <laughs> But when we got home, now, they gave me this trash bag when I walked out of the church. I'm walking to the car, going to the airport, and I got my Bible case, and, uh, and one of my associates is carrying my Bible case, and my pilot is with me. And, and uh, no, I'm taking it back. The pilot was waiting at the airport, but one of my other associates is with me. And I'm walking along there, and one of them said, Brother Jerry, you want me to carry it? I said, keep your hands off my trash bag. <laughs> so when I get to the airport, my pilot he said, Brother Jerry, you want me to throw that away for you? I said, no, you keep your hands off my trash bag. <laughs> so I got in the airplane, and I just set it in the, free, the, the seat in front of me. And I just sat there and looked at it. And when I got home, I brought it into the house. Carolyn was there to greet me. 
And she said, what is that? She said, is that trash from the trip? Why didn't Sam throw it away for you? I said, no, it's not trash. <laughs> Sit down. I want, to, I want to talk to you about this. When we dumped that money out in the floor of my study, it was piled up this high. Ones, fives, tens, hundreds. It turned out to be $26,000 that they had stuffed over in me. Now, we're sitting in the floor with this pile of money. I got embarrassed. I thought, if anybody's looking in my house, they think a drug deal's going on down here. <laughs> Brother Jerry's peddling drugs and there's a long preaching gospel. Well, I've never done drugs. I don't know any, one drug from another. You'll have to ask Jesse about that. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Jesse took trips all over the world, never left his living room. <laughs> I was in the speed, but not the kind Jesse took. Mine was horsepower, okay? And, and we got all this money here. It's $26,000. And Creflo said, it's for me and Carolyn. It wasn't for the ministry. He gave us a nice check for the ministry. So I said, here's your half, and here's my half. She had 13000 I had 13000 She said, what are you going to do with yours? I said, well, I know two families right now that are in desperate need, and I'm going to split it and give it to them. She said, I know three families that are in desperate need, and I'm going to split it and give it to them. We didn't keep one dime. We, we sold it. We gave it to people that were in need. Well, do you think for one minute God just watched us do that and said, oh, that's so sweet. You can't outgive God. I can't, I, can't even, I can't even tell you because some folks would get upset of the harvest that came from that. Why? Because God gives liberally. He's the liberal God. Amen. Our harvest. Line. And we didn't even ask for a harvest. I didn't do that wanting a harvest. We did it out of the goodness of our heart. My, my wife and I live to give. We're givers. I proved that this morning. Amen. He didn't ask me for anything, Amen. but I've always got my ears opening, listening, listening, listening. And I'm not saying, uh, meet me at the back and I'll just shell it out. No, I'm not saying that at all. But I, I purposely listen where there's a need that God wants me to fulfill. And when I heard him talk about that, that goal this morning, that went off in my heart. Here's a seed you can sow. Here's a need you can meet. Here's another opportunity for you to be a blessing. Amen. Well, next time I come back, I'll tell you what kind of harvest came from that. Amen. Because God never forgets the seed sown. Amen. So, let's continue. He satisfies everyone with favor, goodwill, and loving kindness. And once again, from the Passion Translation, when you open your hand, it is full of blessings. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Full of blessings. Doesn't that sound like Deuteronomy chapter 28? And all these blessings will come on you yes. and overtake you. Yes. You'll be blessed in the city. You'll be blessed in the field. You'll be blessed coming in. You'll be blessed going out. When God opens his hand, it is full of of blessings. Amen. Amen. And they all have been reserved for you and me. Hallelujah. Lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord. I receive it. Somebody say, I receive it. <laughs> all right, now, let's, let's get to the key. Now, obviously, I don't have time tonight to cover everything I've already covered back home in three meetings, but I'll just give you enough to wet your whistle. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Now, let me give you a key to receiving the open hand of God. Look at verse 15 once again. The eyes of all wait upon thee, <clears throat> and thou givest them their meat in due season. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Now the Amplified uses these words. Let me have a little bit of that, Dylan. Thank you. And just to clarify everything, this is not homebrew from Fort Worth. It's, it's honey and water, and it helps my throat. Okay. Excuse me. Thank you. <clears throat> the Amplified Bible 
uses these. Has anybody got an Amplified Bible? So you know I'm not making this up. Put, put it on the Amplified. There it is. The eyes of all wait for you. Notice three words. Looking, watching, and expecting. Amen. Amen. Looking, watching, and expecting. Now, if you're not expecting the open hand of God, it's not likely you will experience it. If you're not looking for it, if you're not watching for it, it's not likely you will experience it. Expectancy is very closely associated with real Bible faith because real Bible faith expects. I hear people talking about, you know, I'm just trusting God. I'm just believing God. And then I ask them, what are you expecting? Well, we're just hoping God will help us. That's not real Bible faith. Real Bible faith expects God to do something. Amen. And here it says that those, uh, the, the eyes of all wait for you, looking, watching, and expecting, Amen. and you give them. Notice when people are looking, watching, and expecting, what happens? God honors yes, what they're looking for, Amen. what they're watching for, and what they're expecting. Amen. 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 Now, my, my goal tonight is to leave you getting up in the morning, looking, watching, and expecting Amen. the open hand of God. Amen. 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 If you're looking, watching, and expecting, then you'll not be disappointed. Jesus said, be it unto thee according to your faith. Amen. Be it unto you according to your expectancy. Amen. It's just another way of saying it because expectancy and real Bible faith are closely kin to one another. Yes. Real Bible faith expects. I never say I'm trusting God and then not have excitement about it. Glory to God. Amen. I don't, I, don't, I don't ever say I'm trusting God with a question mark at the end. I say I'm trusting God with an exclamation mark. Because I'm expecting something. Right. Amen. I remember when I was a, a little boy, as I mentioned earlier, my dad raced automobiles all my young life. I grew up on racetracks. And one of my favorite things was to be with my dad. And uh, uh, when dad would come home on Friday evening from work, he'd say, son, be ready in the morning. We're going to the races. That's all I wanted to hear. I lived to go to the races. I mean, from a little boy. And if dad wasn't racing, if he didn't have a car in the race, he was in the pits helping somebody else, a friend of his, get their car ready for the race. So I spent a lot of time, this is a little strange to say it this way, I was in the pit most of my young life, okay? <laughs> and so... I, I love being in there with my dad and watching dad do what he did. What my dad didn't know about making cars fast, they hadn't invented yet. And I love being with my father. He was my best friend all my life. And uh, all my classmates loved being with my dad because we were all into speed back in the 50s and 60s. We all liked fast. And dad knew how to make them fast. Not only that, none of my friends had any money, and dad would do it for free. You know? <laughs> so they loved being with my dad as well. And so when dad would say, son, be ready in the morning, we're going to the races. I, that's all I needed to hear. I'd go get my clothes out, what I was going to wear the next day. Put them on. Go to bed in them. I didn't want to waste time getting up in the morning and having to put on something. I slept in it. What am I doing? I'm demonstrating expectancy. I'm demonstrating expectancy. Not one time. Did my dad ever tell me we're going to the races and then change his mind? Not only that, but when I first started playing Little League Baseball at nine years old, my dad said, son, I'll never miss a game you play. And all the way up to a farm league team, my dad never missed one game. I could hear my dad shouting in the stands louder than anybody else, strike him out, Bubba. Strike him out, Bubba. In fact, when I went to the pitcher's mound, I looked for my dad. And not one time in all those years did he ever miss a game. So when dad said, I'll see you at the game, I expected to see him there. Amen. I got to the pitcher's mound looking for him. Amen. When God says, I will open my hand, Glory to God. I will fulfill the desire of every living yes. thing. That I'm looking, I'm watching, and I'm expecting. Amen. 
How many of you are looking and watching and expecting tonight? Well, go ahead and praise him in advance if you're expecting. Amen? I mean, one of the, one of the greatest expressions of real Bible faith is to be able to praise God in advance before you ever see anything happen. So if you are truly expecting to see the hand of God throughout 2022, then show him with some praise in advance. Hallelujah. Come on, stand up and give the Lord some praise. Hallelujah. Show him that you're expecting to see the hand of God. Amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. The message translation says here, expectant, you give them what they need. And he adds, right on time. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Right on time. Amen. Praise God. I'm, I'm saying to you tonight, I'm not denying hard times. I'm not denying that it's tough out there. And I'm not denying that it's not going to get worse. It is. But I am denying it's right to trouble me. Because I'm expecting the hand of God. In the midst of more disorder and chaos, God is going to open his hands to Jerry Savelle, to Jerry Savelle's family, to Jerry Savelle's ministry, and anybody else that will do what Jerry Savelle's doing, I'm looking, I'm watching, and I'm expecting. Come on, give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Lay your hands on somebody next to you <clears throat> and pray this prayer out loud for them. You're not going to pray for yourself? Hallelujah. Well, thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hey, sir, yes, sir, did you know? Now, I didn't know what you were going to do, but when you walked up, did you notice I opened my hand? Yes, sir. That's a sign of receiving. Yes, sir. Amen. He had his hand open. That's a sign of giving. Yes, sir. It's already working. Amen. <laughs> I received that. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Now, I didn't tell you that story about Creflo's church to get you to do that. In fact, I'm not asking you to do that at all. That was just an illustration. It's only happened to me that one time. But it ain't over yet. <laughs> okay. Amen. I, in fact, when I got home and I was telling Carolyn that, the Lord said to me, you have now experienced the fulfillment of Luke 6, 38. Amen. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken, yet running over shall men give unto your bosom. They gave to my bosom all morning at Creflo's church. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So pray this prayer for the person you're holding hands with right now. In the name of Jesus, I pray over you, my brother and sisters. And I'm praying that as you enter into 2022, that no matter what's happening around you, you will not be troubled. You'll be able to say like the Apostle Paul, none of these things move me. And like the Apostle Paul, you'll be able to decree with great boldness, my God supplies all my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm looking, I'm watching, and I'm expecting to see, to see the hand of God. And in God's hand, in God's hand is, provision is provision for everything you'll need, everything you'll right, need. Now, right now, tomorrow, tomorrow and, in and in the future. So rejoice, so rejoice and, be and be glad. God's got his eyes on you. He's going to take care of you and give him your best praise. Hallelujah. Amen. Give him your best praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. You received that tonight? <clears throat> All right, praise God. Shake hands with somebody and tell them, I'm so glad you came tonight. It was an honor sitting next to you. Come on, Pastor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory. You know, uh, if, if uh, I'm just going to take a moment so you can stay standing, we're not going to take very long. But there's two things that the Lord just reminded me of. And uh, the first one is this, is, uh, you know, Brother Jerry first started coming.
coming to our ministry, I think it was 2009 was the very first time you were here. I've, amen. I've, I've got a picture of he and I in my old office, and neither one of us had gray hair. And so, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, my point is in saying that every year that he's here and he preaches this way, we've went to another place, just the whole ministry. And the second thing is, you know, in uh, March of 2020, March 18th, a matter of fact, on a Wednesday, uh, I was in Kentucky. My dad had been diagnosed with congestive heart failure, and my sister had been up there, and, and uh, I was there helping him go to some doctor's appointments and whatnot. Well, the point I'm making is uh, then, of course, all of the, the pandemic, and they, they put out the guidelines and these different things. And I called my wife, and I said, uh, can you get... Our pastor, Pastor Caldwell, Happy Caldwell, said, can you find out if he can come minister at the church? And here's why. I said, I th our people need the calming voice of a father to speak to them. And he spoke in, in that meeting, and he said some wonderful things. And, and one of the things he said to the pastors, he said, you have to be careful because if you're not cautious, you'll dumb your people down. And they'll start thinking they don't need to come to church and they don't need to be present. And uh, it just brought a calm. Well, we've had a general here tonight that's been through seasons like we're dealing with now since 1969. And is living proof that we're going to be okay. Because God, if God did it for Brother Jerry... God will do it for Brother Philip, yes. and God will do it for brother or sister, whoever you are. Amen? I believe God. Amen? So once again, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you to all of our friends. Amen? Pastor Raphael, Bishop, God bless you. And uh, uh, everybody else, if you're a minister and I don't know you, God bless you. Thank you for being here, and uh, God's good to us. Amen? Well, come on, say it with me tonight, would you? The vision of our church will always be to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God. You and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.